Father, we thank you for this privilege once more of being in this place and anticipating the Holy Spirit's ministry of the Word to our hearts. Father, we say these things for the benefit of those who are here in this hall this morning because they need to know how much you love them and how real the Lord Jesus can be and ought to be to each one of us. And so we ask you that the Holy Spirit will do that peculiar work which only he himself can do, getting first of all our attention and how difficult it is in this confusing world to give the attention of our hearts to the voice of the Holy Spirit. But, oh, Father, today, if we hear his voice, let us not harden our hearts, but to receive what he has so graciously given us. We know that his ministry is to share with us those things that belong to Jesus and all that the Father hath are his, so we have the precious privilege of having shared with us this morning all the things that you have and all that you are. Thank you for sending your precious darling Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die at Calvary for us. Thank you for the reality of what he did there. And oh, Father, I'm, I'm so grateful, so thankful for the gift of grace, which is faith, to believe fully what you did for me and to accept into my heart and to realize in my heart with real conviction that the record you have given of the Lord Jesus is true. We can count on this and bank on it for eternity. He's the only faithful and true one we know. Even though all men should prove to be liars, he will still be true, and his word will stand, though heaven and earth pass away. Now, fathers, we look into the Word and look to the Holy Spirit to demonstrate with power the reality of the good news that there is in Jesus. We pray that each of our hearts may be touched and opened and ministered to. We're the sheep of your pasture, and Jesus is the shepherd. And we gather at his feet, and we know that the great shepherd will minister to each of his lambs and each of his sheep this morning in his own special way. May all of us human beings be hid behind him, covered up by the sight of his glory, and let us come away from this place seeing no man save Jesus only, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. I'd like to read a couple of portions of Scripture from the Gospel of John. First of all, in the 14th chapter of John, at the 16th verse, I'm going to read three verses, and then we're going to jump over to the 16th chapter to the 7th verse. John 14, verse 16. Before I read, let me just give you a little bit of the background so you'll understand where this fits into the Bible record or into the history of the life and ministry of Jesus. The words that he spoke, which I'm about to read, were given to his disciples on the very night that he was betrayed, the very evening before his crucifixion and death. You might say that these are some of the last earthly words he spoke to his disciples before the cross. He'd already been in the upper room and they had celebrated the Passover feast together. After the supper was over, he had knelt down and girded himself with a towel, taken a basin of water and washed their feet. He spoke to them about this great ministry of washing their feet and making them clean again. And then after he had done this and they left the Passover chamber and begun their walk, it must have been late in the evening, late at night, they're making their way towards Gethsemane, the eastern slope of Olivet. They don't arrive until 
about the 17th chapter in John. And so all of his discourse or all of his talk that's going on here was taking place between Jesus and his disciples while they were on their way to Gethsemane and from Gethsemane to be betrayed and fall into the hands of, of his enemies and to be crucified. So he talks to them about his relationship with them and about loving one another tries to take away their fears and comfort their hearts and he says don't let your hearts be troubled if you believe in God believe also in me and I'm going away for a little season but I'm going away to prepare a place for you now it's not a house in heaven as you know the place that he went away to prepare he prepared at Calvary it was a place in the presence of God an acceptance with God which he prepared by the work of his death burial and resurrection and then he spoke to them about their relationship to him being branches and himself being the true vine. And he said the world's reaction to this will be that they will hate you. And they will reject you and they will persecute you. And by this time I can imagine that these disciples must have had a lot of fear and a lot of doubts and a lot of concern. Jesus is about to leave them. They were being separated from him for three years he's answered their questions ministered to them even met their physical needs he's been more than a friend he's been a brother a lover he's been their God and their Lord as Thomas called him after the resurrection he's been their life he's been their way out of darkness into light he's been their way out of death into life he's been the truth that they've searched for and longed for and now he's leaving. And so he begins to tell them a little bit about the Holy Spirit, something that they hadn't heard too much about and someone they didn't know much about. But in the 14th chapter, at the 16th verse, he says, I will pray the Father. He talks about going away. And then he says, I'm going to pray to my Father and he's going to give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. This one that I'm going to pray for, this one my Father will give you, this comforter, this other one just like me, he will be the Spirit of truth. Now, who is the truth? That's Jesus. So he's actually saying he will be my Spirit. It will be the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of God, and he is referred to as the Spirit of Christ who dwells in us and explains the mystery of how the Lord Jesus could be bodily, physically present at the right hand of the throne of God and yet with us 24 hours a day in us, with us, for us. He does this by his Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that indwelled him when he walked the earth as the Son of Man is the same Holy Spirit that indwells us. The same Comforter that walked with the disciples in bodily form now walks in us in spiritual form. As the Holy Spirit indwelt the Lord Jesus while he was here upon the earth making the reality and presence of the Father an everyday experience to him, an every moment experience, so the Holy Spirit dwells in us to make the presence of the Lord Jesus a reality to us. To make the person of the Lord Jesus a reality to us. And he says this spirit of truth, the world, mankind in general, cannot receive him because they can't see him. And they don't know him. No man can know the Holy Spirit unless he knows the Lord Jesus. And those who know the Lord Jesus know the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is real to them and in them, just as he was real in the Lord Jesus when he was here. But the world can't receive him. They can't see him, and they don't know him. But you do know him. Now, this is dispensationally speaking, or this was true for the moment when he spoke to his disciples. For he dwells with you, but he shall, future, 
be in you. There is coming a time when this blessed one who has been with you, and that's Jesus, will be in you. He'll be in you. For I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you as orphans. I will not forsake you like an abandoned child is forsaken of his parents. I'll not leave you in the lurch. I'll not leave you destitute. I'll not turn my back on you and walk away from you. I will come to you. We're having a little Bible teaching here on the Holy Spirit this morning. Who will come to you? I will, he says. Yet he just got through saying it was the Comforter who would come. He just got through saying it was the Spirit of Truth that would come, but he says it's me. I will come. I'm now with you, but I'm going to be in you. The world will not be able to receive me. They won't be able to see me. But you know me. I've dwelt with you, and I'm going to dwell in you. And I promise you this, I will come to you, for I won't allow you to be comfortless. Isn't that precious? Now, he takes the same subject up again in John 16. In verse 7, when he mentions his going away again, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient, it's necessary, it's urgent for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. So it's much better for you that I leave you in bodily form now. It's much better that you see me no more. Because as quickly as I leave you in bodily presence, I will come to you again. And I'll be with you forever. If I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I'll send him unto you. And when he is come, listen carefully, notice the personal pronouns. The Holy Spirit is not just a good influence. The Holy Spirit is not some moral emphasis in our lives. The Holy Spirit is not some mystical feeling that we have. The Holy Spirit is a person, and he is one and the same as the Lord Jesus, and he is one and the same as God the Father. No man's ever seen God the Father. But Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen him. No man has ever seen the Holy Spirit, but if you've seen the Lord Jesus, you've seen him. For in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus are one and the same, yet distinct in their ministries, yet one and the same, and that the Holy Spirit is the same as the Lord Jesus living in us. Because the Holy Spirit lives in me, Jesus lives in me. He came to me. I received him. I received him because he came first to me and talked with me, convinced and persuaded me of his person and reality. And then he came to live in me and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the ministry of the Lord Jesus through the Holy Spirit now in his present age. Because he said, I'll send him to you, and when he is come, he will reprove or convict or persuade or convince mankind of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And then he tells them what his ministry will be to them. I have yet many things to say to you. I, Jesus, have many things yet to say to you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, or when I come to you to indwell you, when I come to live in you, I will guide you. And I like what the Greek says here because it's more impressive. I will guide you into all the truth. 
He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He will glorify me. He shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. And all things that the Father hath are mine. And therefore said I, he shall take of mine, and he shall show it unto you. So you see a twofold ministry of the Holy Spirit or of the indwelling Lord Jesus Christ in the world today. I've related this incident probably before, but there was a time many years ago I was in a barber shop. <laughs> that wasn't the last time I was there, but many years ago I was in the barber shop uh, north of Columbus, and, and there were several men there waiting to get haircuts, and I had an opportunity to talk about that which is very precious and dear to me, and that's the good news which God gave concerning his son. And so while I was talking, one of the men waiting on a haircut looked up at me and he said, Well, if Jesus is surreal, and if Jesus loves you so much, and you love Jesus so much, why did he run away and go back to heaven and leave us all here by ourselves? And uh, it made me stop and think about it for just a minute because I didn't realize that this is just exactly what the world believes because they cannot see him, they imagine that he's gone. The world is totally unaware of the presence of the Lord Jesus here. They can't see him. They don't know him. They cannot hear him because they will not hear him. And because of that, he does not exist. And if he exists at all, he must be up in the sky someplace, sitting on a big throne. And what is that to me down here, trying to make it through the night? But this is not what the Bible says, and this is not what the believer knows. Jesus is just as really present in this earth this morning as he was when he actually walked on the shores of Galilee and on the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem. He's just as active, just as vocal, exercising the same power over heaven and earth that he exercised then, doing the same miraculous things and conveying the same mysterious truth and revealing the same wonderful Father that he did when he was here and walked among the Jews. Of course the world can't see him. They don't know him. He said, if a man love me and keep my commandments, I will come unto him. And I and my Father will take up our abode in him. And we will manifest ourselves to him. We'll become a reality to him. He will know us. And so, in a figure of speech, he will be able to see us with the eye of faith. He will be able to hear us with the ear of the heart. And we'll be just as real, more so, than I was when I was here physically with my disciples. Because remember, I told Thomas on that day of the resurrection, more blessed are those who have never seen me and yet believe. Why more blessed? Because he left Thomas from time to time. He never leaves me. There were many, many wonderful things he could never reveal to Thomas that he's revealed to me. Many precious things that he could not at that time share with Thomas, but he can now with me. So I want to impress upon you before we talk any more about the Holy Spirit. And we're not talking about some vapor. We're not talking about some spirit that is some, some mystical force that moves upon our emotions or some feelings that we have. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about Him being really present right here in this hall. But more than in this hall, He is in us who have believed. Just as real as he was 1,900 years ago 
and he has come to perform a ministry different than the ministry he performed when he was here upon the earth, a ministry that will last until he reappears in the presence of man to take his bride, that's we ourselves who have believed, unto himself in the fourth dimension where he dwells in the presence of God. Now, God has always been at work in the world. His work has changed, but He's always been at work in the world, and He's at work in the world now. And I know that God is at rest, but He's at rest in regards to sin. He's at rest in regards to the work of redemption. He's finished that. But He's doing another ministry. He's doing another work. In the Old Testament, as you read along in the Bible, you find that God... Almighty God, Jehovah. He was predominant in all the Old Testament history and record. And He was for this chosen nation called Israel. He went to battle for them. He stood in their behalf, gave them a law, established their priesthood, gave them a place of worship made them many promises and entered into many covenants with them. So his relationship was always spoken of in regards to Israel. And that was Almighty God, God the Father, the everlasting Father. He was present always in the Old Testament times, working in behalf of his people. Then when you come to the New Testament, you see that Jesus Christ the Son, and he's present in the earth, and he's predominant. And he is not simply for his people. Now he's with them. But that was not the goal. The goal was to be in them. And that couldn't be possible until he had died, descended into the pit, and ascended again to the right hand of the Father, and sent the Holy Spirit to live in them, to indwell them, that they might be his people, and he might be their God. So in this dispensation, in this period of time, God is present in the person of the Holy Spirit, living and indwelling the saints of God, making the person of the Lord Jesus a reality to them, that he in turn might glorify the Father and reveal more of who the Father is and what the Father hath, for all that the Father hath, he said, are mine, and I want to show them to you. Why? Because they're all ours, too. Whatever these things are, they're all ours. Now, I want to talk to you, first of all, about the Holy Spirit's ministry or His work in the world today. And I know that I won't be telling you anything you haven't heard before, and that's not an apology. Uh, I just want to say to you that as I go along in a Christian life, I realize how quickly... Like the foolish Galatians, we can be bewitched. And how quickly, like the Colossians, we can be spoiled by the vain philosophies of men. And I know how quickly, like the Corinthians, we can be beguiled by the subtlety of Satan. And how swift we seem to lose our liberty and go running back to the law of Sinai we might find some relief for a troubled conscience instead of looking again to the cross of Calvary where the conscience is purged once and forever by the blood of the Lord Jesus. And so these are basics and we need to say them again. And you need the Holy Spirit's testimony again this morning of the truth of God. Now you listen carefully. The Holy Spirit's ministry, as far as the unsaved world is concerned, as far as mankind is concerned in general, the Lord Jesus is at work among the unsaved. Oh, I love that thought. Just as he walked by the curbstone of Jacob's well in Samaria and found that dear sinner woman who longed to drink of the water of life, he is still walking the streets of every town in this world, contacting every woman from Samaria, every Nicodemus, every blind man, every Lazarus, every leper, 
He's out on the streets and the highways and the byways. And he is seeking those who will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Do you know that Jesus is ten times more concerned about winning the lost than all the soul winners in evangelism? Jesus is the shepherd looking for lost sheep today. He's not doing it through the great tent campaigns. He's not doing it by radio and television. He is doing it personally. He's the soul winner that God sent into this world. He's the seeker of men's souls. And if you'll read the Bible carefully... You'll find out how deluded we have all been into thinking that if we don't carry the light to men, they're not going to get it. He is that light, and He is present in this world, and He is giving light to every man that comes into the human race. He may give it through me. He may give it through you. He also gives it through the moon and the sun and the stars. He also gives it through the testimony of His creation around. Wherever men live, wherever men exist, black, white, red, yellow, ignorant or learned, savage or civilized, wherever a human being breathes the breath of life, he got that life from Jesus Christ. And that life was given to him that while possessing that life, he might come to know Him. Who to know all right is life eternal. God is in the light-giving business. And as I read this passage early this morning, I was struck with the fact that I had never noticed that Jesus said that the Holy Spirit, when He has come, He will convict, He will reprove how many? The world. The world of sin righteousness, and judgment. Oh, he's at work in the world. He found me. I wasn't looking for him. He found me. He didn't send any soul winner to my door. Nobody stuck any tracks in my pocket. I'm not boasting. I'm just telling you how it was. He sought me when I did not search for Him. He wanted me when I didn't want Him. He followed me when I would not follow Him. He wooed me until He won me. Patiently and persistently, He came after me. I was lost. I wasn't looking for Him. I didn't even know he existed, but oh, he walked with me every step of life's way. And in the circumstances of my life and in the divine appointments of my life, he made himself known to me. And he spoke with me. And he spoke with me about these great subjects, sin, righteousness, and judgment. And as he spoke with me about sin, righteousness, and judgment... I became persuaded, I became convinced, not in the mind, in the heart, that the testimony God had given was true, and I came to rest in it. And that's what makes people Christians, that's what makes them saved, that's what delivers them from darkness to light and from death to life. It's the way we pass from the kingdom of Satan and from the family of Adam to the kingdom of light and liberty in Jesus Christ and to the family of God. The grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. God only gave one gift to the world, and that was Jesus. God so loved the world, he gave. And he gave his only begotten Son. He is that faith in me. When I was willing to receive him, he came to live in me to believe God in my behalf and to seal me with promise that I was his inheritance forever and ever and ever. This is where I first met the Holy Spirit or the Lord Jesus as he ministers among unsaved men. I met him as the one who convinced and persuaded and convicted my soul 
that the record God had given was so and enabled me by faith and that a gift of grace to set my seal to that record that it was true and give my poor troubled soul rest and to give my conscience purging something I could never get by the works of religion and by the acts of self-righteousness. <clears throat> it may interest uh, uh, the, the religious world out there This fact may be of interest to them, that to get a man saved does not depend upon any human being, and it does not depend upon any human argument, and it does not depend upon any human teaching. The Holy Spirit never seeks to prove anything to the unsaved. He never seeks to teach anything to the unsaved. And he never seeks to argue with the unsaved so as to convince them that they're wrong. The ministry of the Lord Jesus through the Holy Spirit in his time to the unsaved is to testify, to declare, to simply tell forth what God says about sin, sinners, and the Savior of sinners, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the provision God has made for sinners in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will not prove it to you. He will not argue with you about it. He will not deal with your rational ideas. He simply tells what is so, and you believe it or you do not believe it. You accept it or you reject it. You rest in it. Or you make an intellectual assent to it and go on living as though there were no good news in it at all and though it had no effect on you at all. I'm convinced that the majority of professing Christianity has never had real faith in the gospel of grace. I'm convinced that the most of professing Christianity draw nigh to God with their lips. Their hearts still far from him give intellectual consent and assent with their lips that God's record is true because they dare not publicly call him a liar. But in reality and in life, the gospel has no effect whatever. And the sacrifice the Lord Jesus made is to them of no more merit than the many sacrifices of the Old Testament law. For professing Christianity is still engaged in a battle with sin and sins. And professing Christianity is still championing the cause of sin and sins. And precious little is said about the Savior who put away sin and who bore away sins forever and closed the subject in the presence of God. But I want to tell you this, it is not the Holy Spirit that continually reminds me of my sins. It is the Holy Spirit who continually reminds me of the sacrifice that was made. And it is the Holy Spirit who continually helps me to forget the sins he bore. We're always remembering what we ought to forget, and we're always forgetting what we ought to remember. For you who have never really rested in the gospel, and there's some of you in this hall this morning, you know it, I know it, and God knows it. A remembrance is made of sins every year in your life, and year rolls around seven times a week. A remembrance of sin made over and over and over and a new sacrifice. New conviction and a new sacrifice. New convincing and a new sacrifice. New persuasion and a new sacrifice. Oh, my dear friends, there are many spirits that work in the world today. They are false spirits. They are the spirits of Antichrist, satanic spirits that have gone out into the world to testify against this testimony of God. These spirits make their living in the world of religion. 
And if you wanted a true example of demon possession today, you do not need to go see the exorcist, for that kind of demon possession doesn't take place today. The kind of demon possession that takes place today is found in the pulpits of our lands. Smooth talking, super salesmen who speak by the spirit of Satan, who say they are ministers of light and angels of mercy, ministers of righteousness, but when they have finished speaking, their message is to this end, let us establish our own righteousness in the sight of God, and let us have more light in our lives so that we can walk the straight and narrow path to God. Let us do in order that we might be what God wants us to be. Hear now the Spirit of God, who is also at work in this world, who is also testifying, but all his voice is so often unheard, and men harden their hearts against his voice. And they are insulting him daily, as Hebrews 10 records, treading under their feet the precious Son of God and counting that blood which he shed as a nothing sacrifice, as an unholy thing that was never set apart for the glory of God and never accomplished what it was set out to accomplish, and insulting daily, and if you let me use a little boy phrase, hurting the feelings daily of the Holy Spirit, hurting the feelings of the Lord Jesus. Hear him testify. You may never hear him again, because I read in the book of Hebrews that it is today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Tomorrow you may never hear his voice again. And you'll be lost in a chorus of voices. And these chorus of voices will bring you ultimately to self-righteousness, to your own works for righteousness, and to hell. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. When he has come, he will convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. This is his only testimony. Sin. He testifies of sin. You say, now we're getting someplace. Let's talk about sin. The Holy Spirit will now testify of sin. Notice, first of all, it's probably obvious to you, that this is not sins in the plural, this is sin in the singular. You have that? He will convince. That is, he will convince those who want to be convinced. He will persuade those who will be persuaded. You set yourself against the Holy Spirit and you will never be uh, convinced and persuaded. You harden your heart and you will never be reproved. But supposing you're willing to listen to him, this is what he'll tell you. And he'll tell you in your heart. He'll convince you of sin. He'll convict you of sin. He'll reprove you for this sin. Not sins. Sin. We say, what's he talking about? Okay. This needs to be said again. I know you know it. We've heard a lot about the sin of Adam. We read a lot about it in the Bible. We read in the book of Romans that by one man, sin came into the human race. Sin. Not sins. Sin. We're talking about the sin nature. We're talking about a ruined, corrupted, reprobate nature. How did man get to have this ruined, corrupted nature? This nature that makes him like a strange sheep, always turning the other way from God. This nature that never makes him seek after God. This nature that never makes him want light. This nature that never wants him to know uh, love and to understand God. How did he get possessed of such a nature? He got it by inheritance. Because he was born of a father who had the same nature. And he was born of a father who had the same nature. 
and so forth, on back to Adam, who was the father of us all. So we've heard a lot about the sin nature. We've heard a lot about the Adamic nature, the corrupted, ruined nature which we inherited by birth, and that's true of all of us. That's the reason we need to be saved. But that is not the subject of the Holy Spirit's testimony. He never seeks to convince the unsaved man of the sin nature. The unsaved man, first of all, knows about the sin nature. You say, how in the world could he know that he has a sin nature? He has a built-in thing called a conscience. It daily accuses him or excuses him. And the book of Romans tells me that even the man without the law, even the man who never heard the word of God preached, the man who never sat under Bible teaching, the man who is ignorant of the spiritual things of God, that man has the law of God written down inside in the inner parts of him. And he knows every time he violates that law, and he knows that he violates that law at random and at will. You don't have to convince any man of the sin nature any more than you have to convince an alcoholic that he's a drunk. He's well aware of it. And if you doubt that statement, go back to the book of Genesis to the Garden of Eden and answer this one question. Did Adam know that he was naked the moment that he sinned? Answer me. He certainly did. Who told him? Some preacher? Say, hey, Adam, I want to tell you, you've got the Adam nature, you know. Hey, Adam, did you know you had the sin nature? Hey, Adam, you need to be enlightened. You've got a bad heart. Adam knew he was naked the moment he ate of that fruit. And the moment he ate of that fruit, and he was corrupted in the sight of God, he sensed his nakedness, and he feared the God he just loved the moment before, and he fled from the presence of the God he had just walked with in the cool of the day, and he hid behind the trees of the garden and frantically sought a way to cover up his nakedness so that he could live with himself. And he was terrified when he heard God's word. That's all of our natures right here this morning. That's what we're like. The Holy Spirit doesn't come tell man he has sin nature. That's not his testimony of the unsaved. So forget that. Secondly, he does not come to convince the world and reprove the world and persuade the world that they are sinners because of their sins. Yet all of modern day evangelism uses this approach. Set me up a tent in the city park and fill it up with people every night. And I'll have the old-fashioned altar lined with earnest souls seeking to be forgiven for their sins. All I have to do is preach on the subject of sins and start naming them. Come back tomorrow night, folks. I'm going to preach on the scarlet sin. Come back tomorrow night, folks. I'm going to speak on the sin of drunkenness and why no drunkard will ever enter the kingdom of heaven. Come back tomorrow night, friends. I'm going to speak on the sin of worldliness. Come back tomorrow night, folks. I'm going to speak on the sin of profanity, immorality. Come hear me talk about sins. And I'll do my best to convince you that you all have committed many of these sins. Let us preach on the Ten Commandments. Great conviction will fall upon you people as you see that there isn't a single commandment you have ever kept. No, the Holy Spirit doesn't minister that way, and he's not in that kind of preaching. That's by another spirit. The Spirit doesn't have a single word to say to the unsaved man about his sin nature, nor about his sins. What do you say? He said he came to reprove the world of sin. He did. But Jesus tells us what that sin was and what it is today. It is this, the sin of not believing on me. You 
Isn't that simple? God sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, from heaven to do something about the sin nature and to do something about the sins that it produced in us that formed a barrier and kept us out of his presence. He signified that this barrier was there by hanging a great veil in the temple of Jerusalem so that no man could enter from without into the presence of God. And that veil, as long as it stood, testified to one thing. The way into the presence of God has never been made. Sinners, stay away. Sin and sins have come between you and the living God. And until something is done about that barrier, until something is done about that veil, until something is done about that wall between you and God, you can never come to the presence of God. But here's the good news, and that's what the word gospel means. God sent his Son to tear this veil in two from the top to the bottom and to destroy this wall and to remove this partition and to bring these wicked sinners, such as we, right into the presence of God. And there he would receive them, not as servants, not as pardoned sinners, as sons. equal heirs with Jesus Christ, mutual heirs of his glory. Paul, this, this is good news. And when Jesus died at the cross of Calvary and he cried, it is finished. That three word message was given not to God, it was given to you who can only come as far as the cross of Calvary. You can't go into the mercy seat. That's for the high priest. You must stand where God made his testimony and look at his sacrifice died and hear what the sacrifice says to you. Here's what he says. It's finished. Your sins are finished. Your sin nature, it's finished. God is satisfied with the offering I am making and I have made and I will make. Here's the good news. Freed from sin. Oh, happy condition. Jesus hath died, and now there's remission. Bruised by the fall and cursed by the law, Christ has redeemed me once and for all. I believe that. I'm going to go to heaven that way. And if I don't get there, there ain't no use you starting. Was there ain't any other way there? I want to hear myself say these things this morning. He doesn't have any testimony of the unsaved about sin and sins, excepting it is finished. Do you know that a man doesn't go to hell for committing adultery? Do you know a man doesn't go to hell for getting drunk? Do you really believe that? Do you know he doesn't go to hell for breaking the Sabbath? Do you know that a man doesn't go to hell for using profanity in four-letter words? Do you know that a man doesn't go to hell for not joining the church? Do you know a man doesn't go to hell because he's immoral? Do you know that a man doesn't go to hell because he has a bad heart and a sin nature that produces nothing but this kind of fruit all of his life? Do you know why a man goes to hell? He goes to hell for committing one sin, one sin, one single sin. It isn't murder, and it isn't adultery, and it isn't rape, and it isn't profanity, and it isn't drunkenness, and it isn't immorality, and it isn't breaking God's rules and regulations or smashing his commandments. He goes to hell for one sin only because in his heart he does not believe God when God says, Christ bore your sins in his body at the tree, and he was made sin for you, that you might be made freely by my grace his righteousness. Two or three weeks ago, I was reading the paper about this Episcopalian priest in Tennessee, I think it was. You probably read it. Horrible thing went around raising money 
in the name of the Lord to build a home for homeless boys. Remember reading that? Then after he'd raised uh, thousands of dollars to build his home for homeless boys, he turned these homeless boys over to a homosexual ring, and he charged these homosexuals uh, exorbitant amounts to come in and spend the weekend uh, corrupting and violating these little boys. You read that? How many of you read that? Okay. So they caught him. Somehow or another, his sins found him out. And he was brought to trial, and he was sentenced to prison. And I've been following the case in the papers. I wasn't surprised. I suppose most religious people in the world were surprised. Oh, an Episcopalian priest. I wasn't a bit surprised. I know some of these people. Nothing against Episcopalian. Just I know some of the priesthood. So I've been following this very closely in the papers, and I was anxious to see what was going to happen. And I didn't realize how much vengeance down inside I was feeling and how vindictive I was feeling. I was saying down inside, boy, I hope they sock the book to him, you know. I hope they put him in jail and throw the key away when he gets there. So I was driving along the car and I heard the news broadcast that he'd just been sentenced to, I don't know what, 40 years in prison or something like that. And I said, couldn't happen to a nicer guy. I hope they give him the smallest, dirtiest place in that prison. And I'll tell you one thing, when he ends up in hell, he's going to get the hottest place there. You probably didn't say anything like that, did you? <laughs> and just as soon as I said that, Jesus talked to me in my heart. And he said, what's so different about him and you? And I said, Lord, I've never done anything like that in my life. He said, no, no, we're not talking about what he did. What's the difference between him and you? He's a sinner, you're a sinner. I knew, but Lord, his sins are worse than mine. Are they really? Are they really? Sin is an offense to God. Sin is a stench in his nostrils. Sin is sin, and I'll tell you what sin is. It's anything short of the Lord Jesus Christ in thought, word, deed, act, moral character, or any other way that you can measure. Are you short of Him? I'm short of Him. I fall short of Him every day. Every thought I have is so much shorter than His thoughts. Every word I speak, I just can't talk like Him. I can't act like Him. I don't look like Him. I can't walk like Him. I don't think like Him. I don't feel like Him. I'm a poor, wretched son of Adam by nature. And if I spent a million years trying to imitate the life of the Lord Jesus, I wouldn't be any closer at the end of the millionth year than I am right now. Neither would you. And the Lord said, What's the difference between that man and you? No, Lord... Then why do you talk that way? You deserve that dirty, stinking prison cell too, and you deserve that hell you're talking about him going to and the hottest place in it. Then the Lord said, here's something to meditate on while you're driving along. Meditate on this. He will be no celebrity in hell. Neither will Elvis Presley, I'll throw that in. And meditate on this. When he arrives in hell, he will be surprised to find out that he didn't go to hell for being a homosexual. And he'll be amazed to learn that he didn't go to hell for corrupting these boys. And he'll be amazed to learn that he didn't go to hell because he broke every law in the book. He will be stunned when he realizes that every one of those sins which the law so severely punished him for were laid upon the Lord Jesus. And he died for them and satisfied God for them. Here's the tragedy is that this man, when arriving in hell, will learn that God never held him responsible or guilty for his sins, for his sins were borne away by the Savior, and his sin was laid upon the Lord Jesus. 
God was finished with sin and sins in this man's life 1,900 years ago. Here's the shock he will have to learn that God didn't have a thing against him except this. And for this, he will spend eternity in hell. He didn't believe God about his sin and sins. I'm assuming that he was lost when I say it. You know why men go to hell? Because they do not believe the record God has given concerning his son. I want to keep saying this. We are not saved by the work that God is doing through us. We are not saved by the work that God is doing in us. We are not saved by the works that God is doing for us. We are not saved by the works that God is doing by us. We are saved, counted righteous in His sight for eternity because of a single work which has been completed for 1,900 years in history and has been a fact since before the earth began. And that fact is Christ died for my sins according to the Scriptures He was buried and raised again the third day according to the Scriptures. And let me tell you something, God is satisfied with that work. I'm satisfied with it, so He and I don't talk any about sin and sins. you got a thing about sin and sins, you'll have to take it up with somebody besides God and me, because neither one of us are interested in the subject. Well, you say Christ died for all the sins of all men of all time. That's an evangelical statement. He died for all the sins of all men of all time. If he did die for all the sins of all men of all time, how come there is no forgiveness for this sin? Simply because this sin did not exist when Christ took away the sins of the world. It had never been committed, could not have been committed, did not exist in history, hadn't even entered into the heart of man yet. It could not enter into the heart of man until the Holy Spirit of God came and testified that God put away sin and sins forever at the cross of Calvary and forgiveness for all. is the gift of His grace by simple faith, taking Him at His word, acting as though it were so, standing on it as though it were a fact. That sin couldn't possibly have been committed until the Holy Spirit came and testified to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when He did, there came a sin into existence into the heart of man for which there is no forgiveness for there is no more sacrifice. So if you commit this sin willfully, after you've received the knowledge of the truth, there will remain no more sacrifice for your sin. Just a fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour you, the adversary of God. For if a man under the law of Moses suffered and died under two or three witnesses for disregarding the spoken word of God, How much greater do you think the punishment will be upon the man who is set in this assembly hall and listened to the testimony of the Holy Spirit to the finished work of Jesus Christ and then reject it, counting the Son of God worthy to be trodden under His feet, the blood of the covenant, not able to deal with sin and sins effectively, and insulting the Holy Spirit? How much greater do you think that punishment will be? I will tell you. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will recompense. And I tell you, this is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This concludes part one of CS 107, Mystery of the Holy Spirit. For the continuation of this message,